And so tonight I'm going to wrap up the, uh, the uh, series I began several weeks ago on analogies in the Bible. And uh, the last analogy we're going to look at tonight is where the Bible likens itself unto water. And as we've been going through these uh, different analogies, we've been trying to appreciate the attributes that the Bible uh, gives to itself and also, of course, to make application in each instance. And we are going to be able to make application tonight uh, how the Bible is likened unto water, and the Bible, or the Scripture, has a spiritual effect upon us, much like water has a physical effect upon us, in that it cleanses us, right, and it quenches us. So we've seen different ways in which the Bible is likened to physical objects, and we're just going to look tonight at uh, the, the cleansing effect of the water of the Word tonight. And just real quick, the first point I want to make is that we are first cleansed by the water of the word in salvation. There's that initial cleansing. Okay? And that's, you know, that's a one-time cleansing that has to take place there. He said there in John 15, where you are, look at verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So what is it that cleans us? It's the word that Christ has spoken. God's word is what cleanses us. It's our faith in that word, of course, we understand that. And if you remember, you know, another great picture of this is uh, the, the rock in the wilderness that, that Moses smote in the wilderness, and the water came out of it, right, and gave them water out of the rock. And that was a picture of Christ, that from him water would come forth, and for our cleansing and for our, uh, the quenching as well that we need. So, the, you know, the first point I want to make here is that we're cleansed by the water of the word in salvation, and that that is a permanent effect. You know, we get clean with water physically, but then we have to do it again and again and again, or at least we should be, right? (laughs) It's something we have to do all the time because we're always going to get dirty. But when we're cleansed by the water of the word and salvation, you know, that's a permanent one-time thing. And if you would go over to John chapter 4, a real familiar story. Jesus said in John 6, uh, he said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. So there's another analogy of, of Jesus. You know, he's the bread of life. And when we receive Christ within, we shall never hunger again spiritually. It's, we're satisfied. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Familiar story in John chapter 4, look at verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest, would have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. Of course, we're probably familiar with the story where Jesus is resting on the well, and he's speaking to the Samaritan woman, and she's gone to draw water. And he's using this opportunity to remind her that if he, she would have asked him to get, uh, for drink, he would have given it to her, and he would have given her living water. And she said in verse 11, The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. So she's not getting it. She's looking at him, so where's your bucket? Where's your rope? From whence hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. So we are first cleansed by the word in, in, in through, and it's likened unto water and the fact that you know, it quenches us permanently. It's a one-time effect. It's something that we only have to deal with once. The cleansing and salvation is permanent. However, and this is more what I want to get into tonight, is the fact that even though we are permanently saved through that cleansing, there is still a need to be cleansed daily. There's still a need to be cleansed from the filth of this world. Not for salvation, but for fellowship with God. You know, we will always have our sonship. We will always have, we always be children of God. We always have that relationship. That doesn't necessarily mean we're always going to be God's friend. That doesn't mean God's always going to be pleased with us. Just like any other parent-child relationship, you know, often they'll, parents are displeased with their children when they misbehave and they do things they shouldn't do. It's not that they've ceased loving them. It's not that that relationship has changed. It's just that that fellowship isn't there, that sweet communion isn't there that they want to have with their children. It's the same way with us and God. You know, we're always going to be saved. We're always cleansed initially by that word. But as we get dirty and stinky in the world, you know, God looks at us, ugh, I, you know, who wants to be around the stinky person, right? No one wants to be around that guy. 
right? That you say, go take a bath, go get cleaned up. So even though we are cleansed initially, we still have to have an ongoing process of being cleansed from what? The filth of this world. <clears throat> and that's what we see over in, go over to John 13, John chapter 13. We'll always be his child, but some people are going to be closer to God than others. And well, where do you get that? Well, I don't know. John was the disciple that Jesus loved. There was only one of them that was leaning on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. And some people, I'm not saying he didn't love them, but it seems like John had a closer relationship. And, you know, that's what we should desire. You, had the, you know, you had the 70 disciples. Then you had the 12, a little bit more of a closer inner circle. And then even within the 12, you had the three, you know, Peter, James, and John, that got up to go to the Mount of Transfiguration, that got to go in and see the young maiden raised back to life. That got to have, and then even amongst those three, John's the one that's right up next to Jesus at the Last Supper. So, you know, we can, even though we have that relationship and our permanent cleanse, we can distance ourselves from God. We can get away from him. We have a need to be cleansed from the filth of this world. Look there in John 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then he cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Excuse me, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So we need to, I want you to pay attention where, you know, where he's saying here. Okay, He's saying, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. But he goes on and he says in verse 9, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So well, I want to have part with you, so you might as well just wash my hands and my head too. And then Jesus saith to him in verse 10, he that is washed, right? He's saying, no, Peter, I don't need to wash your hands and your head because you already are washed, right? You've already had that initial cleansing. You've already been cleansed by the water of the word. You've been saved, right? But he goes on and says, He that is washed need not to save wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are not clean, uh, you are not clean, you're, and you are clean, but not all. So he's showing us that, you know, even after we're saved, there still needs to be this process of being cleansed by the Lord. There's still this process of being washed by the word, right? There's still this process of having to clean our feet. And it's, it makes perfect sense because of the fact that that's what carries us through this world. You know, our feet are going to take us places. We're still here on this earth. We're still having to live out our lives. We're going to come into contact with the world. We're going to be influenced by the world. The world's going to, uh, you know, have an impact upon us. And, and you know what it's going to do? Is it's, it's going to make us dirty. We're going to have dirty feet from walking through this world. And we're going to need to have, it, have that cleansing continue to take place. So what he's showing us is that because we are washed, we, not, we need not to wash save our feet. There is still a cleansing, but it's just of the feet. <clears throat> Why is that? Because our necessary dealings in this world are going to make us dirty to some degree. Because we're still in the old man. Because we still have the body of this flesh to deal with. Go over to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, And we know that we are of God, and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. The Bible says that the whole world lieth in wickedness. So how can we walk through a wicked world and not have it affect us to some degree? You know, if the world lies in wickedness and we're, you know, getting involved, and look, we're all going to be involved with the world to some degree. But, you know, even more so if, we're, if we are worldly, if we're allowing the world to have a, a more of an influence upon us, the more wicked you're going to be, the more filth of the world is going to begin to cling to you. The more cleansing is going to need, more need of cleansing you're going to have in your life. Say, well, is the world really that bad? Well, the Bible says the whole world lieth in wickedness. And, you know, you say, well, is it really that bad? Well, yeah, but can a clean thing come from an unclean thing? Is anything good going to come out of the world? Whatever's going to come out of the world is going to be wicked. <clears throat> The same spring cannot send forth, you know, bitter water and sweet. So if we're allowing the world to influence us and have an effect on us, it's not for the better. It's always for the worst. It's making us dirty. 
It's making us uh, filthy. It's making us having a need to what? Be cleansed of that in our lives. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. We can live a godly life. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Look, we're going to have that divine nature, but in the meantime, we're still here on this earth. And yes, we have, as it goes on and says there, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We know ultimately we've escaped. But the fact is that this world is still corrupt and that we are still in it. And that we are still going to have to walk through this world and be influenced by this world and it's going to have an effect on us. It's going to make us dirty, and there's still going to be a need for further cleansing. The corruption can still cling to us as we walk in this world. And what I'm talking about tonight really is the, what we would call sanctification. You know, there's salvation, which is permanent, it's one time. You know, it, it's not of works, but then there's this process called sanctification. And being sanctified just means being set apart being made, you know, set apart unto the Lord, being sanctified, being holy. <clears throat> so our sanctification begins and continues as what? As we live for Christ. It's a process. Go over to John chapter uh, 15. I had you, should I had you say something there? John 15. Because we're still going to be in this world. It sounds like we got saved and all of a sudden, you know, we, we never struggled with sin again. The world never had any kind of an effect on us again. Because we all know that if we're honest, the fact is that it does. You know, we might not be, you know, wallowing in the mire of sin, but it still has an effect on us. We may not be at home watching smut and trash, you know, but we're still going to see that billboard every now and then. We didn't mean to see it, but it's there. You know, that could have an effect on our mind. <clears throat> and that's just one example. You know, we could think about all the different ways the world has an effect upon us because we're not we are still in this world look at john 15 verse 15 he said i pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but thou shouldest keep them from the evil they are not of the world even as i am not of the world sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth so what is it that's going to sanctify us what is it that's going to cleanse us and separate us and make us clean from the filth of this world it's the word of truth it's god's word the word of God is what's going to sanctify us as we obey it. It's not just, oh, I read my Bible this morning, I'm clean. It's, I read my Bible, I read what was written in there, and I started to do what it said. I went to church and I heard the Bible preached, and I did what it said. That's the process of sanctification. It's not just this mystical thing where we just read the Bible and somehow we just become a better person. You have to put those things into action. That's the process of sanctification. That's how we're cleansed by the washing of the water of the word go to ephesians chapter 5 ephesians chapter number 5 i mean you can go home and draw a bath for your kids and staring at it ain't gonna get the dirt out from behind their ears eventually you got to pick them up and throw them in and get out the rag and start scrubbing that's the same way with us we can't just have our bible and not do we, we got to get in it right and then we got to start scrubbing we got to put some elbow grease into our christian life to get that filth out of the world and everybody comes, you know, ha has this work to do in their lives. No one just gets saved and is instantly just free from all sin. You know, that's a false doctrine. We all have sins and things that we need to work on getting out of our life and constantly always cleaning. And maybe, maybe we got this fixed and then some other, something else is popping up. And we got to put that down in our lives. And some other filth is trying to cling to us from the world. <clears throat> the word of God has a cleansing effect on us. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ uh, loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by what? By the washing of the water, of the by the washing of water by the word. So it's the word that cleanses. It's the word that's going to clean us up, that he might what? Present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle nor any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So, well, why, does God, why is God so interested in cleaning me up? Why is it so important that I 
get cleansed. Because God is trying to present you to himself. You know, we're not cleaning up for one another. You're not cleaning up for me. You know, we're not going to get the filth and the trash out of our life and, and, and clean up our lives because the preacher. You know, if that's your motive, it's not going to last. You know, it's, it's, it's not going to, you're not, eventually you'll go back to that. But here's the thing, if you realize you're getting cleansed up, you're getting cleaned up so you can be presented unto Christ, you know, that's, gonna, that's your real motive. That should be your real motive anyway. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 12. Actually, go over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We are, clep, we are kept clean by the word through the renewing of our mind. It takes uh, action. You know, we have to put some effort into it and then this, to, in order to, you know, for this process to take place in our lives. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that's a very practical application, isn't it? To present your body as a living sacrifice, to not, you know, letting uh, lust just run wild in our life. Not just giving in to every temptation and every sin of the flesh, but actually, like Paul said, bringing our bodies under, you know, bringing them into subjection. That's what he's talking about here. Presenting your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, un again, unto God, not unto a man, which is your reasonable service. You say, well, that sounds tough. Yeah, but God said it's your reasonable service. It's practical. So that's, you know, that's the elbow grease there. That's the practical part of it, you know, of, of, of uh, you know, get, bringing the flesh into subjection. But that's what begins this process here. If you look at verse 2, and be not conformed to what? This world, because the world lieth in wickedness. But you be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we present our bodies a living sacrifice, as you say, I'm going to clean up my life, I'm going to get the sin out, I'm going to stop doing this, I'm going to start doing that. This process takes place where your mind is renewed. And we find ourselves, we're saying, at the beginning, that I'll, I'll never do that. I'll never be that way. Or why, 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 why do you even do that? But then as we go through this process, our mind is renewed and it all starts to make more sense. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's that cleaning up, the renewing of your mind. The word of God, it has this cleansing effect on us. It's the word of God that's going to clean us up. It's the word of God that's going to renew our minds and get the sin out of our life. So really, you know, if you show me a dirty Christian, you know, if that's the reasoning there, follow me with this one, is that if, if, if it's the word of God that cleans us up, right? If you show me a dirty Christian, I'm going to show you a dusty Bible. Show me a Christian who's got sin in their life, who's got a dirty life, I'll show you a Bible that's got dust on it, a Bible that's dirty. Because it's the Word of God that cleanses us. It's the Word of God that's going to renew our minds. It's the Word of God that's going to cleanse us from the filth of the flesh. Now, again, I understand we've been cleansed initially by the blood of Christ. We're saved. We always know that, that we always are. But as we live this Christian life, as we go through this world, there is this need to be continually cleansed by the Word of God. Because the world's filthy. The world's full of sin and iniquity. And it's going to cling to us. We have to get in our Bibles. This is why Bible reading is so important. You know, this is why Bible memorization is so important. You know, people struggle with their thoughts. They have, you know, dirty thoughts or just foolish thoughts, just things that are affecting their heart and their spirit. You know, Bible memory will clean that up. You know, whenever you, it's so great whenever you have your mind just wandering off into whatever, whether it's sinful or just, even if it's not sinful, if it's just vain and empty. Am I the only one that does that, just has dumb thoughts? <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> I'm sure we'd all admit sometimes we catch ourselves like, why am I even thinking about something from 20, 50 years, whatever. Well, not 50 for me, but <laughs> probably not 50 for anyone else. Right? But you know what I'm saying. Like We catch ourselves just thinking about things that don't matter. And we find ourselves dwelling on more on, on things of the world that are just vain and empty and, and probably a lot of times even sinful. 
And God looks down and goes, man, you stink. You smell. Can you stand over there? I mean, I still love you, but I got this other Christian over here. Man, he's been in the Word. He's been cleaning up. He's been putting on the ointment. They smell better. I think I'm going to stand over here. You, you go stand over there. And when you get a bath, you know, when you clean up, then maybe we'll talk. <clears throat> That's what we need to do. That's why we need to be in the Bible. That's why we need to be meditating on the Word of God. That's why we need to be in church for the preaching of the Word of God. <clears throat> Because that's what's going to cleanse us. That's what's going to get the filth of the world off of us. Go over to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. This isn't going to be a long sermon. But I did want to preach this one because it's important. It's important that we understand that just because you got saved doesn't mean that all of a sudden your life is what it should be for Christ. And we still have to clean up our lives. And even if we've been saved for a long time and we've maybe been living for the Lord... If we're not careful, the same thing can still happen to us. Some sin can creep back into our life and, and make us dirty. <clears throat> Psalms 119, are you there? Verse 9, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And, you know, that's, that's important to understand that, especially for young men, this could apply to anybody, but there's a lot of temptations for young men, aren't they? There's a lot of them out there. And the devil really wants to, to spoil them and, and to ruin them. So wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Maybe our way has already gotten dirty. Maybe he would say, well, it's not even a matter of me maybe perhaps one day, you know, stumbling into some slop somewhere. I already have been. You know, I look like pig pen spiritually right now. I just got a brown cloud around me. Flies circling around. How do I cleanse my way? We read it. By the washing of the water of the word. You're clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And again, it's the taking heed thereto. It's not just, oh, I read it. I've heard it. It's taking heed to it. It's putting it into practice. Saying, oh, God wants me to offer my body a reasonable uh, a, a, a sacrifice, which is my reasonable service? Well, let me do that. That's the cleansing of your way. You know, God wants me to, you know, get the sin out of my life. God wants me to start living a certain way. Let me do that. That's the cleansing. That's the taking heed according to thy word. It's not enough to just know what it says. Look at verse 11. He says, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, that's that preventative maintenance. Maybe we're at a place where we say, well, I'm already dirty. Well, here's how you cleanse it, by taking heed according to his word. You say, well, I've, I've managed to get some things together. I've cleaned up. How do you keep it that way? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, I'm trying to, I mean, this is kind of a crass uh, illustration, but, you know, verse, verse 9 is like the spiritual soap, Right? You're already dirty. You got to go in there and you got to clean up. You got to get the, you know, you got to exfoliate spiritually with what? The Word of God. It will clean you up as you take heed to it. As you begin to obey it, that's the the spiritual soap that'll clean you up if you're already dirty. Verse 11 is kind of like the spiritual antiperspirant. (laughs) It's the one that's going to uh, keep you from sinning. From getting, making, you know, so where I'm not going to start smelling and getting dirty, right? That's, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to take some uh, time to get God's word in my heart so that, you know, when I am tempted to do this, when I am tempted to do some sin, I'm just going to think about this verse. I'm just going to take, think about this verse that, uh, you know, tells me not to do that. I'm going to f- memorize some scriptures that are going to help me in whatever area it is you need help with. That's you you know, thinking ahead and, and keep, you know, pre- that's the preventative maintenance. So we have to allow the word to wash us. I mean, once we're saved, we're always saved. We understand that, you know, and, and we can go ahead and live our lives whoever we want. But if you, if you want to be a Christian that, that God can use, that, that God can bless, you have to learn to be that sanctified Christian. You have to go through that process. You know, God's not going to use a dirty vessel. You know, he wants to use clean vessels to do his work. So you have to allow the word to wash you. You have to take heed according to his word. 
once for salvation, right? But daily, like Peter, you have to accept what is needed, right? Peter said, oh, you're not going to wash my feet. Well, then you have no part with me. Let's not be like that. You know, and, and I understand Peter had, he was saying it for the right reasons. He was a, a probably just, you know, taken aback at that the Lord was humbling himself that way. And, you know, whatever. But we don't want to be like that. We don't want to say, oh, you're not going to wash my feet. No, you need to let the Bible, you need to let the word wash you. But if you, that means you have to get in it. You have to read it. You have to memorize it. You got to be there when it's preached. And then you have to actually apply it to your life. You actually do what it says. You have to take heed to it. You have to accept what is needed to be cleansed from the filth of the world. So the whole world lieth in wickedness. Go over to Psalms chapter 1. We're going to close in Psalms chapter number 1. Psalms chapter number 1. I'll begin reading in verse 1 of Psalms 1 where he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Are the ungodly out there today? Are they offering counsel today? Everywhere. The world has its philosophies everywhere. And they'd be more than happy to just take you alongside and, and get your ear and tell you how to think, tell you how to live your life. The counsel of the ungodly is out there. He said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And this is really a whole sermon in itself. Notice the process there. First, you're walking with the ungodly. Then you're standing in the way of the sinners. Eventually, you're sitting down in the seat of the scornful. Ungodly people are bad, right? Sinners are bad. You know, people who are sinful. But, you know, you could say that we were all that, at least at one point. We were all ungodly. We were all without God in this world. We were all sinners at one point. But this is the path that will actually lead you to where you are sitting down with the scornful. Sitting down and listening and participating with people who are mocking God and scorning the things of God. He said, blessed is a man that has nothing to do with any of these people. That has nothing to do with the ungodly, doesn't, stand, doesn't walk in their way, doesn't stand with the, the sinners, doesn't sit with the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. You know, and this is something I've, I've brought up several times, is that when you're going through this process and you're trying to get things out of your life, you can't just leave a void there. You have to fill it with something. Otherwise, that old stuff will just whoop, come right back in. Something's going to fill that space. That's why you have to delight yourself, what? In the law of the Lord. What gave this guy the ability to say to the ungodly, no thank you? What gave this guy the ability to say to the scornful, no thank you? It was the fact that he delighted himself in something else. He delighted himself in the law of the Lord. What, you know, the Bible, the Word of God. You know, if the Word of God is not a delight to us, we really need to search our hearts. We really need to do some introspection and think about what really matters to us. The law of God should be a delight to you. You know, I, I, I know when I read my Bible, I don't go, oh, let's get this over with. <laughs> well, I know it's my duty, you know. It's that time again. And look, I understand there's some days we get in the flesh and, and, and there's some times we're in certain portions of our Bible that maybe we don't like as much as others. But every time we go to it, we should understand what a privilege it is to read God's Word. It's a beautiful book. It's wonderful. You know, I, I, I remember someone telling me once that, that Bible reading, people were, that we were, I was having a conversation with somebody, with several people, and people were talking about Bible reading. They say, well, you know, I, I've learned to, you know, I want to speed read. You know, I want to learn how to speed read so I can read the Bible a lot. And on the surface, you know, that sounds like, okay, yeah, you want to get a lot of Bible reading in. But the problem with that is that you turn the Bible into just some kind of a obstacle to be overcome. You see what I'm saying? i got to hurry up and read my Bible a bunch so I can know what it says. That, that's just like turning it into something, you know, like people say, oh, you need to read your Bible X amount of times. And look, I think you should read your Bible a certain number of times, if, especially if you endeavor to you know, be any kind of a minister. You know, I think every Christian should endeavor to read their Bible at least once a year. That's not a big ask, folks. I know we look at it and we go, that's a really thick book. But it's like, if you're an average reader, it's like 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes. I guarantee you we all have 15 minutes to read our Bibles. But we don't want to ever turn the Bible into this obstacle that needs to be overcome. We don't ever want to turn it into just, you know, having to check it off. Well, I've read it 10 times. 
You know, I'm good, good, I'm glad. And then I was in this conversation and someone was saying something along those lines. I want to learn to speed read so I can just read the Bible a bunch. And I remember somebody else said, you know, that's not how you should read your Bible. And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you should think about your Bible reading like stopping to smell the roses. And I've thought about that so many times. I said, that is exactly right. That's what your Bible reading should be. That's, that's what he means here. The law of the Lord is his, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Have you ever stopped to smell a rose? Literally. <laughs> I'll admit it. I've done it. <laughs> I, I always thought it was just an expression. I was out soul winning one day in Chandler somewhere in some of this beautiful rose bush. And I was like, someone told me once you should stop and smell the roses. And man, it smelled so good. But then I, then I thought, well, I'm going to make a habit out of doing that. Every time I see a rose, I'm going to smell it. And not all roses smell the same. And not all roses have, some roses don't have any smell at all. I didn't know that either. But I never would have known that if I hadn't stopped to smell the roses. I don't know what this has to do with sermon. <laughs> that's a little botany lesson for you. But that's how our Bible reading should be. It shouldn't just be like this drudgery. We should think about it like, man, I'm, I'm going to open up this book. It's going to be like smelling something sweet. You ever bite it? You ever, you ever been real hungry and bite it, get a really good meal, just like, like a savory meal? Man, you, you slow down. You're looking at me like, that's every meal for you. <laughs> I remember when I got married, we went on our, we, I got this head cold right before I got married. I mean, I was completely stuffed. Like I couldn't, you know, when you get a head cold, you can't taste anything. That's the most miserable experience. Like I got, I don't I can't go off on all this, but anyway, this happened to me, right? So we're on our honeymoon and we're driving to uh, where we're going, uh, somewhere outside of Chicago. And I looked at my wife in the car. I said, I said, uh, well, what do you want to do for dinner tonight? And she said, let's go to Red Lobster. Right? I was like, yeah, that sounds good. And I said, what if we went there and there was a Red Lobster right, like, right near the hotel? And I'm, I said something like that. Yeah, Red Lobster sounds really good. And there was literally a Red Lobster like across the parking lot. And I was just like, it's God. It's the Lord. <laughs> and it may very well have been. I don't know. But so we go up to the hotel, we get cleaned up, and we're getting ready to go have dinner at Red Lobster, and then it dawns on me. It's my honeymoon. I'm not going to be a cheapskate. I'm about to go drop some serious coin on a meal. And I can't, I haven't tasted anything in days. And I literally stopped, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, if I could taste this meal, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> I tasted every bite. And the point I'm making is this. You think I'm just talking about food. <laughs> <laughs> is that when I finally got a taste of that, my, my wife still reminds me from time to time. She said, the look on your face. I like close my eyes. I'm like, oh, you know, it was like, uh, it was like, the, you know, the stuffed mushrooms they have there. That was like the first thing they brought in advertising. I was just like, I just like literally like, I'm like bowing down, just like, mm, mm, just like enjoying this meal, like savoring every bite. Cause I hadn't tasted anything for a long time. Like I hadn't tasted anything for days. And now here I am at Red Lobster on my honeymoon, and I'm just enjoying every bite. The steak came, the, the lobster tail came, the butter, those biscuits. You know the cheddar biscuits they have there? Oh, man. That's the only reason I'll ever go back. I don't do Red Lobster anymore. I had a bad experience, but this was back in, anyway. <laughs> I'm bagging on Red Lobster in my sermon. But I'm just making the point, that's how our Bible reading should be. You know, we should realize that when we get into it, man, we should be savoring it. We should be stopping to smell the roses. We should be delighting in the law of the Lord because that's what's going to keep you from walking the counsel of the ungodly. And if we just approach the Bible reading, which we need to what? Cleanse us from the filth of the world on a daily basis. And if we just approach it as just, you know, it's just some, you know, bran muffin we got to choke down. You know what? Eventually you're not going to go for it anymore. You're going to go for all the, you know, the cheap, unhealthy food that the world has to offer. He said, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. I mean, he can't stop thinking about it. It's all he wants to think about is God's word. Look at verse 3. He said, and he shall be like what? A tree planted by the rivers of water. So he's the river, or excuse me, he's the tree, right? He's the one that's planted by what? The rivers of water. So what are the rivers of water? It's the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. So there again, you have this analogy where the Bible's being likened unto water. And it's nourishing. 
he's that tree that's going to, you know, have that sustenance that's going to sustain him, that's going to allow him to put roots down deep and grow big and strong and be, and be fruitful. It bringeth forth fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I mean, who wouldn't want that for their life? Who wouldn't want everything they touch to just turn to gold? And I'm not saying some kind of prosperity gospel, but I'm saying that just they have such a deep root in the Word of God. They have such a delight in the Word of God. They're so firmly planted by that, that river that the world can't phase them. They're not going to wither. They're going to prosper. They're always going to be fruitful, no matter what happens. What storm blows, they're not going to fall over. They have that deep root. Why? Because they've learned to delight themselves in the law of the Lord. So <clears throat> here's the thing. We might not, you know, we might not walk with the ungodly, but we're going to pass by them, aren't we? We're going to pass by them at the very least. And we might brush up against them as we live our lives in this world. We're not going to stand with the sinners, but we're going to stand near them. You know, they're going to have some level of influence on our life just from, just from having to be here. And we will always need to be cleansed from the filth of this world and its ungodly influence. The world is not going to have a godly influence on you, ever. It's, it's opposed to the things of God. So how are, you going to, how are you going to get cleansed? When you learn to plant yourselves near the water, the law of the Lord, the Bible. <clears throat> we'll get, this, will be, you know, this will be accomplished when we cleanse ourselves with the washing of the water of the word. Let's go ahead and close the word of prayer.